Okay, I'll put my question. Mr. Ahmad did that. Last week has told me that if I can prove to him about the Trinity, he'll give me the chance Tuesday. So here I have the thing for him. If you would like to give me the chance, as brief as possible, Mr. Ahmad did that. He wants to deliver a lecture on the Trinity. I don't want to deliver a lecture. I just John, want to show the Yes, John, please. I said... You had even a Sunday morning with Mr. Ahmadira. Wow. Yeah. Two hours. In fairness to those people who may have a question which is more pertinent, which pertains to tonight, I think in fairness, then please let somebody else take over. Would you go mm -hmm. to the back, please? No, Mr. Ahmad. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Didat, ladies and gentlemen, may I appeal that um, humbly that you would change your rules a little bit. Firstly, that one can pose the full question. Look, we have listened for one and a half hours, mm -hmm. and I think it would only be fair if you could give us at least two and a half minutes to fully bring forward a question. Sir, may I be, let me, Yes. I hope you don't misquote me or misunderstand me. Right. Yes. If you are capable of coming to put a question, and I'm, I'm trying even to change my expression, if you are capable of coming to put a question, it means that you should have listened. I trust you didn't spend sure. the time there by preparing uh, uh, yeah. whatever you wish to. Now, I'm going to be very emphatic, and if you quote me as being unfair, then I say I accept the blame. I asked, please put the question, I'm going to insist. If the man has said something and you want clarity for yourself or for the people here, if you have the ability to change a statement into a question, to change anything, I think any person who knows a little bit of the language, he can put a statement into a form of a question. Certainly, I want to do that. My question is only, can I speak more than six sentences? Because you interrupted me yesterday night after the sixth sentence. So, you can't understand the question unless, unless you listen to the whole. And it might take I maybe two I minutes question, to put the whole point, question just, forward. Just point one, one correction, please, for you. May I quote last night and on the night before, uh, or some evening, you said, I cannot see how all the Muslims can sit still without asking a question or without doubting. In other words, you're thinking for them. Now you under, now you give the impression that Mr. Dira will not understand you if you cannot put a text. Please, I've let now three minutes. Could you put the question, see if you know the text? Okay, if you give me three minutes. Um, Mr. Dira said that if uh, Jesus would have claimed to be God, he would immediately bow down, uh, even be cut off his head. Now, for me, the crucial question is not whether somebody um, claims to be God, but whether God appoints him and authorizes him to be God. May I read to you what God says uh, on I? Jesus Christ? Yeah. Please, that is the question. And I would like to ask what Mr. Didat thinks to that. Um, God says about Jesus Christ, about the Son, he says, that is in Hebrew, uh, chapter 1, verse 8, if you want to read, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, in the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up right. like a robe, like a garment. Brother. They will be changed, but Brother. you remain the same, and your ears Brother. will never end. Now, my question is, um, this is clearly stated about Jesus Christ, about the Son. Right. Now, how, can Mr. Just... how can Mr. Didat claim that now, before... Jesus was not authorized as right, before thought. the others come up let me say you know out of uh, tolerance I didn't wish anybody here even my brethren would cut me up if they feel that I've cut you up mm -hmm. but I say if a lecture is given and we state what the conditions are I ask you please to accept and I said those people who are coming up now are then accepting those terms we will allow it with you in case you think I'm being unfair would the others please formulate a question if you don't mind sorry that right? was a question yes but I my mean, question uh, is uh, Mr. Didat, how can this statement say anything else than that Jesus is God? I think that is I think with, what with has happened is, uh, Mr. Chairman, our brother doesn't understand English. 
or my English at that. Hmm. I said there is not a single unequivocal statement where Jesus says I am God or where he says worship me. You quoted a lengthy text and there's not one word about Jesus. But is Jesus speaking that? Did Jesus speak that? God speaks about Jesus. That is I more said, authoritative. Look, who told you that God spoke that? It's Paul. Here in scripture. Look, this is Hebrew. It says here in scripture. Hebrew was written by Paul. I am asking, what did no, your Lord God Jesus say? Before. He says, I can of my own self do nothing. That's not the point. The he point says, is what God says about you, he not says, what you say He about says, you. my father is greater than I. He says, my father is greater than all. Right. Where does he say, I am equal to the father? Could Where I, have I am the father. Well, he is his own father. Himself. Where does oh. he say? Look, we are could I, could I have the next question, please? I think you've had your chance. But it was not answered. I'm sorry. I mm, well, that is your opinion. You're entitled to it. I, please. Yeah. Mr. Rida, may I read my question to you? The question is, can Jesus be an ordinary man or prophet if he is stated to be faultless and without sin? We believe that all the prophets are faultless and all the prophets are sinless. That is our belief, including Jesus. So that doesn't make a man into a God. See, we say, person is Jesus God. If the man is faultless, man is faultless as man. Peter says, he says, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. Not a God approved of God. He is a man. We say he is a mighty messenger of God. He is a prophet of God. He is a messiah. He is a great miracle worker. But he is not God. And he is saying that himself. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. God can do everything of himself. Whatever God wants to do, he can do. But Jesus is limited. He can't. He said, of that day, no, no man, no, not the angels, nor the Son, but the Father in heaven. In his, in his knowledge is not like God. In his power is not like God. He is crying some, to somebody else, God for help. He's falling on his face and he's praying. He's crying on the cross, Eli, Eli. Is he himself? He's Eli. Is he God himself? He's crying to himself. He seems like a drama. They do it in films. I said, Jesus is not film acting. He's crying to God. And the one who's crying to the Father in heaven, he is the real God. Not Jesus. He told us, come, I'll teach you how to pray. He said, pray like this. Oh, our Father, we sat in heaven, yours and mine, including Judas, because Judas was in the group, he's the father of all. Where did he say God is his exclusive father? That he begot him? Where? No, these are all our, you know, it's the teaching of the church. Jesus Christ never said. On the contrary, he's proving that there is but one God and he is subservient to God. He said, all power is given to me, it's not mine. Why callest thou me good? There is none good but except one, that is God. Where does he say he is that God? That is what I was asking. Show me, and I am prepared to accept. Follow your church. Next question, please. Thank you, sir. May I have more than one question if I go back? Yes, yes. Thank you. Mr. Didad, if you quote Acts 2.22, where Peter says that Jesus did by, the, by God's power the miracles, which is right, then why would you not accept what Peter says in later in the book of Acts, particularly 4 verse 12, uh, about under no other name is anyone saved except by Jesus? Thank you. uh, you're not trying to prove by that that Jesus is God, I hope. Uh, no, I'm trying to prove that, uh, that if you take one source, then why not? No, no, I would be prepared to accept that. I said, look, he's talking to the Jews. Ye men of Israel, you Jews. Because Jesus came for the Jews. And in his time, Jesus' time, there was no other way. It was identical to in the time of Moses. In the time of Moses, we said Moses was the way to God. The children of Israel, they thought it through the golden calf. God didn't like it. He said, look, this is what I want. You have to go through Moses. Whatever Moses tells you about God, you have to accept. In the time of David, David was the way to God. In the time of Solomon, Solomon was the way to God. In the time of Jesus, Jesus was the way to God. In the time of Muhammad, he is the way to God and for mankind for eternity. So in every dispensation, the man of God is the firstborn of God. He is the representative of God and as such you must listen to him. That's what it means. So I accept that, that the people, the Jews, they had no other way because there was no Muhammad there. If they wanted to follow Jesus, 
they must listen to now Peter, he is represented. Peter says, look, this is what Jesus wanted you to believe, that he is your Messiah. Follow him, follow him. Salvation is yours. Thank you. Mr. Dida, um, I must admit that you know the scriptures very well, but you don't understand them. Um, Mr. Dida, um, I don't uh, proclaim to have to answer your questions, but I would like you to explain two questions. Uh, I'd like you to explain two issues, you know, to me. And that is the first one, when Peter walked on the water to Jesus, um, then he, he sunk into the water. Jesus stooped down to help him, and then when they both got into the boat, according to the Bible, it says that they worshipped him in categorical English. You, on previous lectures recently, said and explained it away that uh, Thomas um, exclaimed, Oh, my Lord and my God, in a way of uh, getting a fright. But in a case like that, I'm sure that Jesus would have rebuked him, knowing the law of the commandments, don't take the name of your God in vain, because that would be clearly taken God's name in vain. Would you kindly just explain it to me? There was nothing about Peter, Peter worshipping Jesus. You see, this worship, this word worship, you open your new Bible now, new Bible, you'll find a different word for worship. You'll open the RSV, you'll find a different word for worship. You see? Right, but what, what, what are the alternatives, what are the synonyms used for worship? And everyone is worship. Right. Now, now to the Jew, if the Jew worshipped Jesus, you see, that means all the disciples were worshipping him. If Peter worshipped him, then all the other disciples likewise must be worshipping him, because Peter was the leader of the disciples. But we find nowhere the disciples ever prostrating before Jesus at any time, the eleven, or the twelve, worshipping him. Worshipping him means that you are our God. You see, this word worship, you ask the Roman Catholic. Look, they ha have a good knowledge of the scriptures. You know, they claim an unbroken chain of popes from First Peter to today. Now you ask them how many types of worships are there? And they will tell you there are three different types of worship. Right? You say about your sweetheart, your fiancé, I worship her. But when you say you worship her, do you mean you love her extremely, you know, beyond measure, but you're not taking her for a goddess? Look, this is an expression we use commonly. He says, you, you know, you're worshipping the guy. You, this is money, my God, woman, my guide, says the Frenchman. We say you are worshipping money, you're worshipping women. But you don't say money is my God, or you don't say woman is my God. But you use the word worship. Worship is an extreme form of love. He must have been very much humiliated and you know in lovingness he must have embraced a man which according to your King James version has used the word worship but now if he was worshipped as God that would be something he said now look he is our God then he must say so then he said look they were all worshipping him but at no time do we hear that they ever worshipped him as the people instead of worshipping God he's telling you come worship God the Father in heaven he is the only God he is the real God no time did he say I am God worship me did he? At any time, if he said, look, I am God, yes, yes, I'm, uh, yes, you can answer that. If he said, no, no, if he said, I am God, this is the claim I made, I think, no good, no good. You see, the, I, I made a claim, very simple, straightforward. If you can show me in your Bible any version where Jesus says, I am God, or where he says, worship me. Simple English I might speak. Where he says, I am God, I said, I am prepared to accept him as God. If he says, worship me, I am prepared to worship him. He must say, not Peter, not James, not Paul. He must say, I am God. He must say, worship me. Because if he is God, my salvation depends upon that. And I don't want to go to hell. I want to follow him. Now that is just, may I interject you there? That's the very 
point of issue there. Now, you are describing mannerisms of worshipping where the Bible doesn't um, elaborate on at all. Jesus but, does. But the fact remains is, the, uh, the, the disciples worshipped him in the boat. And he allowed it. I mean, and that's Jesus, all it says. Jesus, Jesus showed you how to worship. In the garden of Gethsemane, if you remember, he says he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. Yes, Didn't he I said you an example? You, respect is, uh, you are reading an, uh, uh, words into the Bible. You, you find that verse in Matthews. And he went a little further. Oh, except the fact that he, 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 he dropped down on his face right. and so on. So, so but that, uh, that makes no eyes. So the fact remains the Jews, the the Jews. worshipping. Then how did the Jews worship? Look. If you want to know the Muslims how they worship, you go to the mosque. Go to the mosque and see how they worship. You see, Sallallahu Akbar, they stand, they read chapters and verses, they go into semi bent position, they get up, they go down to the ground, touching the forehead onto the earth. This is how the Muslims worship, right? So if I said, look, this chairman or the people worship Didat, meaning that they, man, they loved him with exceeding love. Right. That, but now you say worship. Now, the, if the people have a wrong idea, they say, look, what did they do? Did they make ablution and come? And did they fall down prostrate before Mr. Didat? He says, no. He says, what do you mean they worshipped him? He says, no, no, no. Oh, man, you know, they were gone mad after him. Now, that's quite a different thing. He says, now you are using a word and you are explaining something else figuratively. But that's exactly so, what you are doing now. No, I'm not doing that. Jesus Christ and all the prophets, they had a form of worship, the Jews, which you are not following, you don't know. Look. And Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God. And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and prayed to God. And Joshua fell on his face and prayed to God. And Jesus fell on his face and prayed to God. Look, everybody falling on their faces and praying. What is this? This is the way you worship God. Fall on your face and pray. The Pope, wherever he goes, he kisses the ground. He makes the prostration, as the Muslim does. See, he's maybe, I don't know, he's communing with the soil or what, I don't know, but he's doing exactly as a Muslim does. He, then you might say he's worshipping the ground. He goes to Nigeria, he worships the ground there. He goes to Poland, he worships the ground there. No, he's not worshipping there. Is, he's showing some kind of humility, respect, maybe. But now, Moses, this is how he did it. Jesus did it. Abraham did it. Joshua did it. But you don't do it. So you have your own idea about worship. Could we... Uh it's running out of time, brothers. Could we have, uh, as we are standing here now, as we are standing here now, could you put a question? I will include you, sir. Could we end there a question per person? Right? Could you speak into the microphone, otherwise they can't hear you. I believe that Mr. Dirad is well-schooled, like the previous gentleman said, and understand that he has a great intellect. Right now, is that the question? No, not yet. Oh, because I would have said yes. I admire him for his courage as well as his knowledge. But there's one thing I am quite disappointed about, Mr. Didat. Could you could you put him a question, please? Yeah, it, no. let, it boils let, down to that. Let me explain. This will not solve the other people's problem. Yeah, yeah. Some people, even of the Muslims, feel that I'm unfair. If I stop you, but let me put it to you this way. If you want to have a lecture to the people, call them together and say, this man has called the people, we ask, could you ask a point which is ticklish, let him regal out of it and explain to the audience or get caught. But please do not give another lecture. No, I'm not giving a lecture. I'm, this, this is leading up to the lecture. I'm, I didn't prepare myself to, to, to get the man down as such. All right, my question is that I want to know how Mr. Didat interpret understands and interpolates all kind of context of the Bible. For instance, Jesus uh, in the book of um, John says, uh, the Father and I, or I and the Father are one. How does he explain that? Because if I am Mr. Jonathan as I am, I can't be my father and I cannot make a statement claiming to be that my father is me. Mr. Yeah. Jonathan, uh, if that is your name, could I say, you must have listened attentively because you are interested, but so was I. I'm open to correction, but I think Mr. Dinot explained that. The very truth thing when he said, me and my father are one. Am I right, brothers? Um, did he not explain that? Mr. Or did he? Mr. Chairman? No, all the, no, I'll answer that's the question then. Thank you very much. Yes.
Uh, Mr. Chairman, just allow me to. You see, um, like this gentleman that was here before me, Mr. Didak was interpolating things. Like, for instance, he but read I, something. But in now, you've asked the question, you can answer, you can also understand the question. Okay, I understand. Sure. Thank you. I did explain, I think, that this oneness that Jesus was talking about was in its context verses 28, 29, 30. That is the context. That no man can pluck them out of my hand, 28. No man can pluck them out of my father's hand, verse 29. I and my father are one. That is the context and I feel that any reasonable person could see that. But, since the Christian has an idea that this oneness implies you know, getting into a sausage, like one sausage, one piece, like uh, God Almighty told Adam and Eve that they twin shall be one flesh, like a sausage. They were not, they were still two separate persons. Now this same John, the one that we have quoted, John chapter 10 verse 30, in John chapter 17 verse 20 to 22 he explains what oneness is. He says that they all may be one, O any one, all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, who, the disciples, among them, the traitor, Judas, among them, Peter, who cursed, abused, and swore him, among them, the ten, who left him in the lurch when he was most in need, all these, the Father, the Son, and all these twelve, may be one, that they all may be, also may be one in us. I in them, and thou in me, and that they may be made perfect in one. I'm only quoting the yes. same John. So in other words, all the twelve disciples and Jesus and God made in their one sausage. Is that what that oneness implies? All, you know, putting through a mincer and taking them out as a one sausage. What is this oneness? It is a oneness in purpose. You see, the same oneness that Jesus has explained in John 10, 30, same oneness Peter and uh, Judas and the doubting Thomas, everybody, all with one with God, one person, I in you and you in me and they in us. What is this? Sausage? So if you understand it like a sausage, then I, know I have no answer. But I said, no, this is not that one sausage business is talking about. It's talking about they all are one in purpose to do the will and plan of God. That oneness. There is no other oneness. He's one with God, meaning whatever God wants him to do, he's doing. He's vibrating at the same wavelength as God. That is oneness. Not he becomes God or God becomes man, Jesus. Thank you. Next question, please. Mr. Didat, I would like to ask you this. <clears throat> I think this is my second part. Into, into. Can I just bring it down? That Come closer to the microphone. Okay. I would like you have given us a definition of Allah and John chapter 1, the word, God, the three, the various words. I would like to ask you the question tonight is that how can you separate deity from deity when the Bible says that in the beginning God, which means you never mention this word tonight, you mention ally. You mention Allah, you mention the Greek words for God in the Greek word, but you never mention Elohim. When it is in a plural form with a masculine ending, can you just explain to, for, to me how do you divorce deity from deity? Thank you. Uh, the problem is that the Westerner is reading an Eastern book. The Bible is an Eastern book full of metaphors and similes. And the very first people who came in touch with this book were the Greeks and the Romans. Now the Greeks and the Romans, they had their man gods beyond counting. You know them. Jupiter, the god of heaven. Pluto, the god of hell. Vulcan, the god of fire. Neptune, the god of the sea. Mars, the god of war. And Zeus was the father of all these gods with his many wives and many children. This was Greek mythology. But among such a people goes a new religion, new idea about a new son of God born in Palestine, Jesus Christ. So what was metaphorical to the Jew became literal to the Greek. And they became the pioneers of that message to your forefathers, to the Westerner as well as to you. You know, Indians, coloreds, Africans, all. 
the white man, he inherited from the Greeks and the Romans, and in turn, he gave that theology to you. Now, im Elohim, if I went on to explain, El means God in Hebrew, Ela means God in Hebrew, Elohim also means God in Hebrew. And you say it's plural, and that's very correct. It is very correct that it is in the plural. But you see, the Hebrews, as well as the Arabs, both are Semites, Semitic languages, and they both have two types of plurals in their language. There is a plural of respect, and there is a plural of numbers. In every Eastern language, including my own, we have two types of plurals. Plural of numbers and plural of respect. So this im, you ask the Jew, it's his book. He says, when you say hello im, are you thinking of Jehovah, Moses, and who else? He says, no, 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 it's only God. But he says, who is this im? He says, no, it's a plural of respect. Come to the Quran, say. In the Quran we read, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafizun. That it is for us, us, to send down the revelation and it is for us to protect it. Now who is this us? Ask the Muslims. Muhammad, Holy Ghost, Jibreel and Allah? He says no. Who is this us? This is Allah. But he says, why is this us? He said, this is a plural of respect. And no Arab Christian has ever asked a Muslim in this 1,400 years, who is this as in the Qur'an? When the Qur'an says, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say, He is God the one and only. And yet He says, Inna, Inna, we have created the heavens and the earth, and we have done this, and we... Who is this we? He said, no, this we is a plural of respect in our language. This is a plural of respect in Hebrew. John, next question, please. Salaam <laughs> Adida. My question that I want to put to you, I have noticed that you so fair to the Hebrews, to the Jews actually, and the Jews is just as ignorant as Mr. Ahmadidat. <laughs> this is my scripture. Who <laughs> unto us, listen, Mr. Ahmadidat, John what do you say to this? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now this prophet Isaiah, you know the prophet Isaiah, and this one that he talk about is Jesus. Now why did he use the word, and he shall be called the Almighty God? Thank you. And he shall be called the Almighty God. I want to know who called him the Almighty God. You have 27 books in the New Testament. In the 27 books, who called him, Jesus, the Almighty God? Yeah, let, let John. Isaiah the prophet, which I said, you said, he shall be called. Yeah. Right. This was written 600 years before Jesus was born. Yeah. Right. So, when you say he shall be called, then somebody must call him so. Mm -hmm. 27 books, in the 27 yeah. books of the New Testament, there is nowhere he is called the Almighty God, there is nowhere he is called Emmanuel. You see, Emmanuel means God with us. Now this is a quality of a person, and that quality of a person when he displays, like Eli, Li means my God. You I, know talk, this, I talk about the Old Testament. Yes, yes, I'm talking about the Old Testament, Eli in the Old Testament, in the first book of Genesis, 60 times the word Eli is used. Yeah. Eli means my God. You say this. Eli means my God. Is the name of a priest. Eli is the name Eli, of a priest. Not Eli. 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 All right. You, you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, you see now you pronouncing like a, a European. Yeah. I'm pronouncing like a Jew because because I'm nearer to the Jew. I'm nearer to the Jew in my language, Arabic and Hebrew are sister languages, so I say Eli. You say Eli. I said, okay, Eli. That, that's why I said you're just as ignorant as a Hebrew. Right. Next question, please. Right. Next question. 
Mr. Leader, I think your booklet that was distributed tonight. The so, booklet, please. Sorry, please. that is relevant to the topic. To the lecture, to the lecture. Yes. Oh, yes. Very much so. That was written for the very reason, as you can see in the introduction, to Correct. show that Jesus is not God. Am I not right? Now, you state there that um, Jesus cannot, con cannot be called God because he is a racial God. He was a tribal Jew. Oh, it's May all, I brother, please read please, the context? He did not say that in his lecture, I, I, I insist. I'm sorry, that is no, relevant. I'm sorry to you. I asked about his lecture. His topic. No, I asked about his lecture. Please, can I, can did I appeal? Did he mention that in his lecture tonight? Can I appeal that? You can, you can see that separately. I asked, did he, did he mention that in his lecture tonight? Did he? Look, Mr. Did Dida, he mention it in his lecture tonight? Did Mr. Dida prepare his lecture before tonight or not? No, I say, did he mention it in his lecture tonight? He did not. Did, did he Could I have the next question, sorry. please? Did he prepare his no, lecture I'm before No, I'm sorry. No, next question, please. You did I, not obey. I'm not going to give you a question. I can't I've said really pertaining that. to the lecture what he said tonight. Thank you. The next question, please. John, I'm not going to allow another question. I'm eh? oh, sorry. I thought it was John. Next question, please. I'm sorry. Next question, please. Sorry. Can, can I please appeal to it? To Mr. Dida. No, I, I, I will tell Mr. Dida also to sit still because I'm in the chair here. The next question, please, because you seem to want to work up the emotions. Concerning Jesus being called the Son of God and the scriptures that you went through this evening, tons of sons, uh, in Mark chapter 14 and verse 60, and I appreciate you knowing our scripture, uh, verse 60 and following, uh, they, that's Jesus standing before the, the council in his judgment. They asked him if he was the Son of God, and he said, you say that I am. And then they asked him further, and he says, in essence, in, the, in his language, yes, I am. Then the high priest began to tear his clothing and accuse him of blasphemy and say, what further witness do we need? So didn't he take his claim at that point to be the Son of God as something more than just saying, I'm one like everybody else because of the reaction of the high priest? If you remember that trial, that midnight trial you're referring to, before the trial, the chairman of the Sanhedrin, he had already passed a verdict. And the verdict was, it is expedient that one man die for the nation. So they were intent by hook or by crook to do away with the man. Because this man was a danger. You see, just about 24 hours before he had marched on to Jerusalem, he had ex upset the money changers' tables. He had whipped the people in the temple. Now, this young man, if things go out of hand, there will be a danger. So he said, it is expedient, not it is right or wrong, it is good or bad. It is expedient that this one man should be put away. So they had that midnight trial, and you read the trial. They brought false witnesses against him. One after another, and they couldn't tell in the evidence, if you remember. They couldn't tell in the evidence. So Jesus sees the fast that this trial was. So he says, I speak openly to the world. I ever thought in the temple and in the synagogue whether the Jews always gather and in secret have I said nothing. In other words, I would never say anything in secret which I was not prepared to say in public. No secret doctrines with him. So you can bring hundreds of witnesses to testify. Why is it that you are getting false witnesses and even false witnesses can't tell you? Now, the argument he put forth was so potent. They had no witnesses. So the officer standing by slapped him in the face to shut him up, the third degree. You remember? So Jesus says, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? What are you hitting me for? Right. So you can see from the word go, the whole thing is a farce. Hook or by crook, they want to condemn the man. An innocent expression like son of God. Look, Jesus is telling you in John chapter 10, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. Look, this is son of God. I said, he's got them by the tents. But people are called gods. And you, in your language, you're not finding fault with that. In other words, look, this is the genius of our language. When we talk like that, we don't mean literally. You see? So now, since they were looking for trouble, he said, art thou the son of God? Means a righteous man. You remember on the cross when he cried out? The centurion, what did he say? He said, here is the son of God. The other gospel writer says, what did he say? He said, this is the son of, uh, this is the son of God. The other one says, this is a righteous man. So righteous man and son of God are used synonymously by two writers of the 
of the New Testament. The same expression, one says he is the son of God, and this same man is supposed to have said he is a righteous man. So in other words, are you a righteous person? All the Jews, the rightful people, you know, the, uh, the prophets are called gods, and the sons of God, he are gods, and all of you are the children of the Most High. In that sense, he says, I am. But now, since the guy was looking for trouble, he said, what proof do we need more? Because there was no way of convicting him any other way. So he starts performing. But you note what he did. As soon as the same people go to Pilate, they change the charge. Art thou the Christ, the son of the living God? He said, I am. Art thou the Christ? He is the Christ. Son means a righteous person of the living God. He says, yes. But the same expression, Christ, when they told Pilate, he says, he's claiming to be Christ a king. Here, they said, he's claiming Christ a God. So, you can see on the very face of it, that this is hook or by crook. They want to do away with the man because they didn't like him. This is it. Um, thank you for your answer. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not going to say anything. I was thinking about saying something naughty, but I'm not going to do that. Thank you very right. much. Many thanks. But I have the next question. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Didot, uh, I would like to express myself, you know, clearly that I, you know, Glad to be here tonight, you know, to listen to you. And about what's worth going out is that I do agree that there are tons of sons of God. And that the Bible said that all those who have received him, they become sons of God. But according to the, uh, uh, what we are talking about is tonight, that I want to ask you that the Bible said that great is the mystery of the Godhead. That God is manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirits. See on angels preaching unto Gentiles, believe unto the world, and receive up into glory. Would you like to explain me that scripture? This is our friend Paul talking, I take it. See, this is Paul. Look, when I ask the Christian, who are you following? Who is your master? You say, Jesus. I say, what does Jesus say? Look, a learned man of the Jew comes to Jesus. Mark chapter 12, verse 29, I think. And it says, Master, what commandment is the first of all? Look, simple language they are talking. What commandment is the first of all? The most important thing in faith, what is it? And Jesus answers and says unto him in the Hebrew language, Shama Israel Adonai Elohim Adonai Echad. It means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord of our God, the Lord is one. Could you remain seated, please, brothers? We are going to end very soon. Please. So he repeats word for word what was given by Moses 1300 years before, without the change of a dot. Why should a learned man of the Jew go to Jesus, he is described as a scribe, means a learned man. He goes to Jesus and respectfully says, Rabbi, in the Hebrew language, he a Rabbi, Master, Teacher, Bishop. What commandment is the first of all? Why should a learned man go to another learned man and ask the simplest of questions which any Jewish child could have answered 2,000 years ago? It's a problem. You see, like you are a mathematician, you go to Einstein, the master mathematician, and you ask him what is 2 plus 2? Does it make sense? No. Unless he has gone off somewhere fundamentally in his calculations. So you're trying to draw his attention say, wait a minute. Einstein, I respect you, you are a great man, but what is 2 plus 2, sir? Not that he doesn't know what is 2 plus 2. So this learned man asking Jesus, what command was the first of all? Why did he ask him in the first place? Number two, the reply that he gave. This was 1300 years old. Why did he repeat? Why didn't he say, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's the real answer that he should have given according to Christendom. Christendom's answer the, of the first commandment is, if I asked any learned Christian, what is the first commandment? Oh, he can rattle it off. The first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But if I asked you, what is your first commandment? Not what is the first commandment, what is yours? You are puzzled. Anybody would be. You see, so what I mean is, the importance that you ought to give to the first commandment, what are you giving to? Because you, when you were born, if you were born a Christian, you were baptized in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Am I right? 
if you are a Trinitarian. Christian, you are not born in the titles. No, no, are you a Trinitarian? You believe in no, God? No, I believe in one God. You are closer to us. I believe in one God. Right. That's why the Bible said, it's a great is the mystery of the God being. The God there is no mystery. Is. No, 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 we say there is no mystery. Is the, look, God says, in the Bible we are told, God is not the author of confusion. Right. So the confusion that you have, you know, look, among the whites of South Africa, there are 1,000 different sects and denominations. 1,000. Do you know that? There are 3,000 among the blacks of South Africa. 3,000 different sects and denominations. Who is the author of them? God? Is God the author? No. No. God is not the author. So, we said, look, there is no mystery. God Almighty from the very beginning, He says, I am God, the one and only God. He threw Moses, he says, Shama Israel, Adonai, Ilohainu, Adonai, Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. Jesus says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. Muhammad says, Qul hu Allahu Ahad. Say, He is God, the one and only. There is no mystery about it. The mystery is the creation of the church. If you are not a Trinitarian, if you don't believe that Jesus is God, whether you are born again or not born again, you are very close to us. You see, you have taken a step in the right direction towards Islam. Well, as I said, that I believe in one God. And as, the, as, as I co uh, quote, quote the scripture, that he said that God is manifest in the flesh. Now, then immediately you believe in three gods. You no, see, no, I, no, I don't agree with that. You see, when you say he manifests in the flesh, meaning that God came down to earth, God incarnate. He is God incarnate. You believe that? God that incarnation too. That he came into flesh, that means God took human form. Exactly. He, 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 that means he incarnated, not reincarnation. You see, reincarnation means you're going to die and your soul might go into a dog or a pig or into another human being. No, that is reincarnation. We are not talking about that. Incarnate means God taking human form. The Hindu says Rama took, God took human form in Rama. They say God took human form in Krishna. The Christian says God took human form in Christ. So if you believe that God came down to earth in the form of Jesus Christ, then the voice that was heard from heaven, whose voice was that? Was it God's? Because he's already come down, he's taken human form. He was in his mother's womb for nine months. Look, the Bible says so. When he was eight days old, he was circumcised and named Jesus by the angel when he was in his mother's womb. Who was in his mother's womb? This God incarnate. God came down and he was living in his mother's womb for nine months. I am asking how did he pull the strings to run his universe from his mother's string, from his mother's womb. Huh? And then helpless little creature like one, you and I, imagine. The Almighty God, is that the form he took? With all the filth and the muck, made his mother impure for 40 days? Is that the same God who came down to us from heaven? Please, my dear brother, you see, though you say God is one, in your mind you've got three. No, I'm just not sure. I haven't got three in my mind, sir. But thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Brothers and sisters in Islam, please, we will not be long. Let me say that there's an air I've got to clear. Some of you may have taken offense at the stopping of the, of the speaker or the questioner before. But if you have followed the lectures, then you would have found in there at least three evenings. And every evening, he tried to take the stage or the platform to give a lecture or a counter lecture or a sermon. And m my standards were quite clear. And I felt very bad because I didn't want to stop him. I wanted him to put a question. No matter how difficult it may be, that's not my department. Then I would like to say that I joined the firm as a salesman in 1965, I trust you can calculate and see it's 19 years ago. I then went to do business with a Christian friend of mine, and the business that I'm in, your age next birthday is important. I'm tempted to say that he was 19 next birthday, but I won't go further with that. But while I was in his sitting room, he was in the kitchen, or went to the bathroom, and on his desk, he was a very churchly man. There was a book about that thick, I'm speaking of 19 years ago, How to Present the Gospel to Muslims. 19 years ago. Last night we had people quoting very doubtful books, trying to mislead the people. On the parade, 
When I went on a Friday for Jumu'ah, I had my face on walking to my car, and suddenly the person preaching there saw me coming as this way I saw, and he changed his topic and he said, you don't have to pray for 30, uh, fast for 30 days, you don't have to perform salah five times per day, you don't have to waste your money to go overseas on the travel, you just got to accept Jesus. Now you know that's very tempting to some people. So you want to know what is the onslaught? And I was asked to mention something, and at one stage I decided no, because maybe it gives undue importance. But there was a questioner who was not here tonight, and he followed us very, very closely each night. And every night he came to put the question, and every night uh, he had to laugh at himself. But that is the very man who is running a tent in Missile's Plain for preaching the gospel, and he's got Arabic inscriptions on the tent. Well, he's entitled to it, anybody can write Arabic. But you know that there are so many of our brothers and sisters who would fall just for that. Why I'm saying this is, what is the aim of this, what did we gain from this series of talks? What will Mr. Dira feel when he goes back? What did I achieve? In no ways was it a, a conversion campaign. The people who came here tonight with respect to them, I don't think you can convert them, that was not the aim. I get the message I get is that we have found in Mr. Dira a person to champion our cause. We, were, we are a minority group. We always has been in this country. But I want, I, to, I would like to see in my heart that the message we got out from you that we've got the courage to stand up and we no longer have to feel that we're the underdogs. But I think the message which comes through very loud and clear, <laughs> the message which comes through very loud and clear, brothers, that these Qur'ans which were sold here over the evenings, they were not sold for nothing. The message is that you and I have got to go and read. We've got to go and prepare. You don't have to read the Bible. I think it's been made easy by the tapes, by the videos, and by the booklets that your job has been done for you. Study it, use it, and see that your children can use it. But the Quran that you've been given, you've got to study. You've got to study all the faces of it. And I would like to end by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these series of lectures amongst all the other good things that are being done by Muslims in the Cape must sink into our hearts that we can stand firm and unite. I will ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must give Mr. Dida lots of barakah, lots of umar inshallah for what he has done for us. And I would like to believe that we don't need him here in the Cape again because I feel that he would have left sufficient behind. He's most welcome at all times. It's not that we've got to go out and fight people. We don't want to go and talk to everybody unduly, but when people come to us, that we've got the answers ready, we need not fight with them, we need not argue, we can do it in a nice manner. I ask the Imam to make dua for us, inshallah. <laughs> والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم تب علينا توبة نصوحة اللهم تب علينا توبة نصوحة يا رب تب علينا توبة نصوحة يا رب وفقنا إلى الخير يا رب جنبنا من عمل الشيطان الله مرحمنا فأنت بنا راحم ولا تعذبنا فأنت علينا قادر ولا تسلط علينا بذنوبنا من لا يخافك ولا يرحمنا يا رب العالمين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وأدخلنا الجنة مع الأبرار يا عزيز يا غفار يا رب العالمين وصلى الله على خير خلقه ونور عرشه أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة إلى حضرة النبي مصطفى محمد اللهم اغفر لأهل القبور من المؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات ارفع لهم الدرجات وكفر عنهم السيئات وضاعف لهم الحسنات وتوفى الأمة على خير برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وصلى الله وسلم دعواهم في سبحانك اللهم وتحية في سلام وآخر دعواهم الحمد لله رب العالمين